I want to kick off my conversation with Aisha by sharing uh, a confession with you. Uh-oh. So, so go back to 2017 when Intel bought Mobileye for $15 billion. At that moment, I was convinced that, I was so convinced that uh, autonomous driving was going to take off and rule the world that I shared privately with people, it was private, that I was convinced that neither of my kids would, my youngest kid would never have to get a driver's license given the, given the proliferation of Uber and given the imminent revolution in, uh, in, in autonomous driving. Well, I was wrong. My kid is uh, off to college and has their driver's license. So I got caught up in the hype. I was naive. I fully admit that. Um, I would love to hear from you, um, you know, what role do you believe the industry played and continues to play possibly in helping to generate that hype? I shared mine privately, but there are maybe counterparts of yours who've helped to publicly generate a sense of that this is inevitable and that it's coming soon. Does the industry share some of that responsibility? This is the part where he gets to do privately and I get to do it in public, yeah? <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I just bared my soul publicly. Um, I have a slightly different viewpoint on this. Um, I think we, we have a tendency to want to label things instead of looking at history and look at, looking at how things happen. You have to have irrational belief, exuberance, to go after something this worthy, this transformative, and this impactful on society. So you want the people who are starting to be naive, and I don't mean that as an insult, I actually mean that as an intellectual compliment, and to think it's gonna happen tomorrow morning. Then you get all of the effort, all of the energy, and you get probably too many people even going after the problem or the opportunity. Then things settle down and we normalize, and then a few companies are left, and because it's worthy, we do the work, and eventually the normal rules around uh, execution, around points on the boards, around building a business, take hold. And I think that's the phase we're in right now. But the three things that are super important, it's, we know the demand is there. It's being served today, though differently. Uh, we know that it will enable amazing things for society, whether it's uh, from a safety standpoint, from a climate standpoint, productivity, and we know it's going to be, uh, to be happening. So that's what's really important. But the normal beginning exuberance is uh, required. Do you need to change the way you talk about this, the way you set expectations, and how do you balance that with the need to continue to generate excitement around it? It's important to generate excitement among the public, and. You have, you have CEOs to serve at, 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 at Amazon as well. I was wondering how long it would take before we got to Amazon. Anyways, uh, look, I think we've been fairly balanced. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, I don't think we need to be, uh, we're a lot more realistic. We've done enough testing, enough, uh, seen enough pilots to know what it's going to take uh, to solve this problem. And so I think we need to be optimistic. I think we need to show progress. There's a lot of progress, specifically in this city. Uh, you don't have to go far to see the progress. And uh, my fellow travelers are doing actually a great job on that front. Uh, so are we. So I don't think we need to talk our way into things. We just need to, you know, sh show and tell and uh, keep scaling, keep expanding. And that's all it's going to take. The rest will come. Um, getting, uh, I want to come back to some of the technolo technological questions in a minute, but I also want to talk about some of the ways that we have thought traditionally about autonomous driving. There is a perception uh, that has been perpetrated by the industry, I would say, including possibly some of us in the media, that machines are smarter or better at driving. But when you think about, and, and that people are, make dumb choices, and let's face it, a lot of them do. But when you look at it on a miles-driven basis, people are actually a lot safer than that rhetoric would suggest. And it's really hard, and we, you know, we talk about how well robot drivers are actually better than, than humans. I'm not sure that that's fair when you look at it on a miles-driven basis. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so do we kind of need to you know, fess up to the idea that maybe humans aren't as bad 
and machines are maybe more flawed than we're giving them credit for, or it's too early to make those, compar those, those comparisons? Again, um, I think, uh, first of all, I'll, on this one, I'll speak for myself, not for the industry. Uh, out of the gate, I've been very clear. Uh, 40, close to 45,000 fatalities in the United States due to car crashes, and the majority of them are due to somebody making, essentially, doing something dumb, that is not acceptable. I hope we never live in a world where we think that losing 45,000 Americans when it's totally avoidable is okay. Computers are extremely good at following rules, right? And by computers, I'm generalizing. The sensors, um, all of the software, by the way, all of the functional safety too. And given that those 45,000 fatalities come from human error, a lot of them, obviously computers will be great at that. But I have been extremely clear uh, you know, when you come in uh, from corporate America and go into this kind of space, everybody thinks she's going to be too conservative. I'm like, yeah, whatever. The reality is there's a metric we don't talk about enough, which is what you're alluding to, which is that in the United States, collectively, we drive 100 million miles per fatality. I mean, we're pretty darn good at driving. And how do we do that? First of all, by not being dumb and doing stupid things like getting drunk and driving, looking at our phones and all that stuff. But we do that because we're extremely good humans, as measured by the last 2,000 years, at dealing with sudden things, with things we haven't seen before, at adapting and making quick decisions. Computers are not as good at that yet, and it's going to take a while. And you can't just do regression against that because it's about scenarios. It's not about number of miles. And that is why the problem is hard. That's why we're making progress. That's why we're being cautious. And along the way, it's really important for these robotaxis to be super safe. And this is why Zooks, from, the, from inception, I don't take credit for this, the two co-founders set that up. They started with the robotaxi as a business and say, if you take those two metrics, the 45,000 and the 100 million, how do you redesign and re-architect the vehicle, and it is not a car, let's not argue about that today, it is a robo-taxi. How do you react, what redundancy, what safety, what systems, what sensors, what compute? How do you put points on the board to prove your testing? How do you build a quantitative safety model? How do you look at getting stuck and how do you deal with that? How do you look at comfort metrics? Right. And that's why I think we have to be balanced. How much of your testing is done in real world scenarios on roads versus running regressions, running, you know, running these, you know, running the systems through a computer? We obviously do a lot of simulation. You can't solve this problem without uh, simulation. When you're changing things, uh, you know, you have a new um, release every two weeks, obviously you have to have great simulation. And also when you want to look at the va variation around all the scenarios. Now, we do a lot of uh, testing on test tracks. Uh, we have a private, uh, access to a private facility that behaves sort of like public roads. And as we announced uh, a few months ago, we're testing uh, on public roads in California. And uh, yeah, it's a little route, uh, about, you know, kind of a mile um, also each direction, but it's a mighty route because uh, you've got four or five companies and towers of employees that are coming and going and driving. They have no patience for waiting or what have you. Uh, you have um, sort of a fire truck emergency um, vehicle depot, learn a lot through that. Lucky us, there's also a an active construction zone. Uh, you have pedestrians, uh, trucks, um, people on those uh, uni thingies, I don't know, scooters. Right. So yeah, uh, lots of scenarios. So we absolutely test on, um, on public roads in California, in Foster City, and uh, we really focus on scenarios. That's what matters to us. When you look at miles driven, miles testing miles, um, you know, Cruise, Waymo, pretty far ahead, you're about 9% if my math serves last year. What do you need to do to change those, those dynamics? I love how he asks leading questions. Like first he makes a statement in the question. I'm not conceding that I'm behind. <laughs> That's not happening. <laughs> no. Uh, look. Uh, Lots of uh, respect uh, for uh, my fellow travelers. It's a big market, and uh, uh, three U.S. companies making it, or four, is a good thing. We have a different approach. We, ch we don't chase the number of miles. It's also capital intensive. You have to be very careful with how much money you deploy, because I know, um, you know in Silicon Valley, sometimes we forget, but the money chickens, they always come back to roost, so you got to make up for them at some point. And so, no, we go after the number of miles we need 
to hit the scenarios that we need. And right now, we've been scaling at a rate that we're very happy with. And we're, we're getting sort of very close to the optimal number of miles that uh, we need per year for our approach. What are, the, what are the problems that are most, the thorniest problems that you need, that you're losing sleep over, that the, the, the ones that we still need to solve for in order to prove to the public that it's safe, that I can put my aging parent in a robo-taxi because I can't get in the car for whatever reason? What do we, what do we still need to solve? So, I sleep pretty well. <laughs> Um, because basically I can't function if I don't sleep and nobody wants that. Uh, but I get the essence of your question. So we can't go too fast. We, we really have to be responsible and we look at these big inflection points, right, in transportation, for example, but also whether it's the virtual transportation like the internet. I was in wireless for a long time. It's not that long ago that we saw the first sort of GPRS text go through on an LCD screen. We were like, wow, but we wanted the world of today and we had to get our way there. So we can't scale too fast. We, can't, we cannot compromise on safety, any of us, because that will hurt all of us. Now, in terms of technology, I will say it doesn't keep me up at night yet. It will someday, I think, but we're starting to work on it. Snow is complicated. Uh, the vehicle dynamics are manageable. I mean, we're testing on snow as we, uh, like, on a, you know, fairly well. In a real world? In the, no, not in the real okay. world, on test track. But the vehicle dynamics, basically, that's where you test them first. The, the issue with snow is that the way the stack is built today from a perception, uh, prediction, and then uh, planning and eventually control of the vehicle, that really depends on the world around you. That's why we're geofenced. Right. And that, that also depends on testing you've already done in either those scenarios or similar scenarios. Right. And when it snows, depending on how things were snow plowed, uh, depending on what the city does with the snow and how it does it, you're basically facing a world change and one that's very dynamic and very unpredictable. And uh, back to the 100 million miles, we don't like dynamic and unpredictable. Uh, teeing up, a, we took a survey, if you, could, if you could call it up for one of my future questions. Um, uh, on that question of snow, um, where, where should you be testing? And where do you want to be testing in order to, because you're not going to get that in Foster City anytime soon. And Vegas, right? You're in Vegas as well. Yeah, we're in well. Vegas too. Look, first, we have a lot of work to do. I, I, um, I talk to our team a lot about earning the opportunity for the next step or the next phase. We certainly have a lot of work to do in um, what I call the Sun Belt, where the weather's nice, uh, where there is a business because there are dense cities. San Francisco is one, but there are many, many other cities. Uh, because we, we just can't wait to solve snow to get out there. So what this means is that uh, cities that have a lot of snow, uh, as measured by number of days uh, per year, will come later from a deployment standpoint. And as far as where we need to be testing for that, I think you know the cities where it snows in the United States, as well as I do. Where do you, where would you like to be? Where would you, I mean, you, I mean, the prize is New York City. Okay. That's the prize. Okay. But uh, buyer beware. We have a lot of work what needs before to, we can all drive there. What needs to be done in order for you to be able to start testing some of your robo taxis there? We have to be successful in the cities that uh, we have already declared we're going to be in, like San Francisco and Las Vegas. Yeah. Accumulate a lot of data in parallel, do a lot of testing. Uh, apply some of the latest techniques, see what, what we can do around snow to accelerate, uh, see a way of simulating, and then we'll go there. But one of the things, this is, this, this is a journey. We'll, we'll just get there over time. You've had some pretty big milestones recently, including in February, getting the, you know, getting the permissions, et cetera. Um, what, is the, what, do you, you know, what is the most important thing you've learned once you've been able to kind of get your, your machines right in, into the real world? And two, how has that brought you closer to, how much closer to commercialization has that brought you? Uh, we're getting quite close. Uh, we would not have uh, started the journey on public roads unless uh, we were. I mean, I don't have a special date or anything like that because that would be inappropriate, but we're getting quite close. Uh, the, we're getting a lot of feedback. Uh, nothing better than your employees writing. You know they have a lot of opinions. This is Silicon Valley engineers, right? They think they are all UX designers, so uh, we're learning a lot. Uh, we're learning a lot about the service. I would say the most important thing is the operational aspect of it, right? 
Uh, we have a purpose-built vehicle that is built specifically and only for this. So we're learning uh, from that standpoint. As far as uh, the actual launch, it will come when we meet all of the metrics that we have set for ourselves. And uh, they're making good progress. Um, a show of hands. Uh, you probably saw the survey. They took it away. But at, at, at maybe the question wasn't asked the right way. But maybe you could just, if you've had a, a uh, if you've been a passenger in a self-driving car and know the Tesla self-driving, that doesn't count. Raise your hand if you've if you've been a passenger in a cruise or a. Okay, so it's still pretty. It's still pretty. It's still pretty small. Um, in order for um, in order for you to right now, your only uh, your only passengers are Zook's uh, employees. In order to kind of widen that, I'm not talking about commercialization, but like just getting you know the general public. What needs to happen for that? So there are Before stages. The first thing to be allowed on public, well, first you have to have a, a, a vehicle that's street legal, right? Um, uh, FMVSS applies to everyone. Uh, then you have to have your state driver's license, I call it, right? Uh, then, at least in the state of California, it starts to differ from there. In the state of California, uh, then you have a series of permits from the CPUC. Uh, one is for external folks without charging them. And then the last stage is for external folks and charging them a fare. And so we're in the middle of, that, uh, of uh, that stage of application. We recently tallied up the number of projects that Andy Jassy is eliminating that were begun under his predecessor. Uh, what's his name? Um, Jeff Bezos. I, I, what uh, can you tell me, uh, give me a sense of kind of what the conversation is like with senior management at Amazon about the kinds of things that they need to see in order to demonstrate the viability, the commercial viability of your business? Because I mean, clearly, clearly they're taking a very, a much closer look at expenses right now. What does that conversation sound like right now? Look, I mean, we're super grateful uh, for Amazon. Uh, they've been a great parent. Uh, it's nice not to be uh, tin cupping uh, every night uh, for, you know, a lot of capital. Uh, they ask really good questions. Uh, we have a plan. Uh, what they expect from us is that uh, we execute to what we said we were going to execute to, and we're putting points on the board and uh, generally meeting our milestones and then uh, getting to um, commercialization when we say we're going to do, that would be a pilot and an entry, and from there, scale and iterate. So I get asked this question a lot. I promise you it's pretty normal, boring conversations with good questions, uh, good what about this, what about that, how is it going, and that's You're still it. still using the six-page the six page. I memo. love the six-page. Yeah, uh, how often are you having to resubmit? <laughs> Well, you don't write one and then uh, it's uh, forever. That's not the way it works. And for every meeting, uh, you write one. And so every time we meet them, we have one. Uh, we started using it inside of Zooks too. Not like mandatory, but uh, it's it's very sobering way. First of all, the meeting is very organized because that's kind of weird, but you, you come in and the first thing you do is you read the document. So there's no, I wasn't there, I didn't hear it, I didn't read it, I didn't prepare, I wasn't at the scene of the crime, none of that happens. Because you read, everybody reads the same doc. You, uh, then you ask uh, macro questions, like sort of the overall or overarching point of the doc, and then you go page by page and everybody gets a turn and asks a question. And then uh, if there are decisions or action items, um, they are recorded and then you move on. So we write one every time we have, um, uh, we have a meeting, and at Zooks, we, we use them for, you know, big, hairy, complex topics where it's really important to look at all point of views and to look at all upstream, downstream, sideways, to get dissenting views, and uh, yeah, I love the six-pager. What is Zooks' valuation right now, and how does it compare with what it was when Amazon made the acquisition? So, uh, well, <laughs> it's higher than when Amazon made the, made the acquisition, thank God. That's good news. That's very good news, I think so too. Uh, How much higher? Well, it's higher. <laughs> One of the things though that we, we're not very, uh, we want to get to market. Look, it's, the business exists, right? Uh, customers want it. We believe there's time expansion possible. I still think about, you know, my daughter is 17. I'm like, well, I don't know about this mode of transportation versus that mode of transportation. 
uh, you have a lot of teenagers, you have uh, busy areas, you have uh, people who need uh, meaning, meaning of an all, more senior people. So the market is there. It's really about hush, say what you're going to do, do what you're going to say, execute, get to market. And if you provide value and you're safe and you're responsible, the opportunities are boundless. What is going to be most surprising to me when I have you on stage in five years? I think when it comes to Zooks, how thoughtful we were in preparing to get to market so that once we get to market, the ability to iterate and the ability to gain and maintain customer trust is really high. You think you'll be to market by then? Well, five years, come on now. I don't have all night, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Thank Aisha you. Aisha Evans, CEO of Zooks. <laughs>